Good morning again. Let's uh, grab your Bibles and turn to Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2. When I did an introduction to the book of Hebrews, I gave you the setting that this letter was written to Jewish people who have come to believe that Jesus is the long-awaited Messiah. And they were being persecuted to return to Judaism. So this is during the time when you have the temple in Jerusalem. You have the mandate from the Old Testament to travel to Jerusalem at least, at least on three different occasions throughout the year. They would offer up the Passover sacrifices and different sacrifices throughout the year. They were under that obligation but now that they have trusted in Messiah, those, all those sacrifices have been complete in his once and for all sacrifice. The Messiah has come on the scene and all these Old Testament prophecies are being fulfilled. They were fulfilled in Christ. And yet these Jewish people found a tension. They were being persecuted to return and many of them started returning. The writer of Hebrews gives five warnings in this book about departing from not only a profession of faith in Christ, but an actual living, walking faithfulness to Christ. And how long were people to continue to profess Christ and to follow after the New Testament commandments? Well, until they meet the Lord in glory, meaning it was supposed to be a lifelong following after Christ. We may not be tempted this morning we're, as a matter of fact, probably none of us here are tempted to turn to Judaism. Maybe so, but hopefully not. Most of our temptation would be to fall away from the Christian faith, from our actual walking out our Christian faith, to due to various reasons which we're going to unpack as we get through this book. Because it's not only that warning, a warning about sin entangling our lives and I think Hebrews is going to be such a blessing to walk through. And today we see our first warning. Let me ask you about warnings. How many warnings, how many warning labels do you see in a week? As a matter of fact, you're probably oblivious to most of them, right? How many of you get, ever get coffee somewhere and it has a warning label on the coffee mug itself? Warning, the contents are hot, right? But we see all kinds of warnings. When I was a security guard at Kansas City Power and Light, I would have to walk through diff different gates and check all the doors in the buildings. But as I walked through these huge transformers, there were these warning signs that danger, electrical current, current can burn you and kill you. And so as I would walk through these transformers, I realized if I veered to the left or to the right, if I wasn't paying attention, the guys told me that if I got too close to them, all they would file is a, find is a pile of ashes. Do you think I took those warnings seriously to pay attention? Well, listen this morning, and I'm going to give you a couple other illustrations of warnings that are very serious that will hopefully relate to you. I want to read the text, and then we're going to walk our way through point by point, verse by verse. So let's read the text, second chapter verses one through four i'll pray let's let's read together for this reason we must pay closer attention to what we have heard so that we do not drift away from it for if the word spoken through angels proved unalterable and every transgression and disobedience received a just penalty how will we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? After it was first spoken through the Lord, it was confirmed to us by those who heard. God also testifying with them, both by signs and wonders and by various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his own will. Let's pray together. Father, this morning, each of us, we recognize are in danger of drifting. And we pray that we would take to heart the seriousness of not paying attention to this warning. 
Father, this life is fraught with so many dangers to our souls. May we take our soul seriously. There's an eternal destiny hanging in the balance, heaven and hell. Father, would you strike in our hearts this morning of every single believer how serious this warning is not to take your grace for granted. Father, we thank you for each one that's here. We ask that you would use your word to bring conviction where needed and encouragement where needed. We pray as always, if anyone is here that's never experienced your saving grace through Jesus' death and resurrection, we pray that you would draw them to yourself, even today. We pray, we pray that you would grant them a new heart so that they could see things anew, experience the new birth, and then to follow you all the days of their life. And we thank you that you are the God, as Romans 15, 5 says, you are the God who grants perseverance. We pray this in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. Pam and I and our family were fortunate, I think around 2008, to go to Yosemite Park. Her mother took Pam and her brother and sister and their families. We went to California. And many of you have seen pictures of the Half Dome at Yosemite. Maybe you've been there. But there is a 370 foot tall waterfall. That you could take a three mile hike up to it. And all along there, there are warning signs. Do not get in the streams. Over 300 people have died going over that waterfall since the 1800s. And you might say, well, that's not too bad. 300 in the last, what, 100 years? That's not too bad. But let me read you a headline that I saw. As you're going up there, like I said, there's warning signs. It says, stay out of the water. Here's one of the warning signs. Powerful hidden currents will carry you over the fall. Stay back from any the slippery rock at the water's edge. If you, listen to this, here it is. If you go over the fall, guess what's going to happen? Now, it doesn't say guess what's going to happen. <laughs> okay. It says, if you go over, you will what? You will die. The NBC headline of 2011 said waterfall victims hugged tightly as they went over the edge. A 21-year-old, a 22-year-old, and a 27-year-old went over the 300-foot drop. See, as you look at the current up there, it doesn't look that bad. And you get in the current and you start waiting. And two of them slipped and the water started to carry them towards the edge of the waterfall. Somebody else jumped in thinking that they could save the two and all three went over the fall. One witness said, what I will take away with me forever is the look on that grown man's face as he was floating down that river knowing that he was going to die. No one could help him. If you get online and you type in articles like this, here's another headline. After hikers plunge over the falls, listen to this. Yosemite says the warning is adequate. National Park officials said they have no plans to add any new warning signs or other protections to this area where three were swept over the 370 foot waterfall drop. Did you hear what I hear what they said? The warnings are what? Adequate. Let me just tell you this. What we're going to see in the book of Hebrews are five different warnings that are adequate to keep you from what? Drifting. From falling away. To apostatizing. And we're, as we go through Hebrews, we're going to see this theme develop. And you might say to me, Kendall, Kendall, wait, time out. Christians can't lose their salvation. We're under grace. And let me just say that. I do believe the Bible grants eternal life to every believer. On the other hand, all of these warning signs are also true. God uses these warning signs in the lives of genuine believers to keep them on the path of the Christian faith. We must, in one hand, bear the warnings to mind. And if these warnings come true, that we do abandon our faith and practice, these warnings should be a cause to cause someone to quickly come back. And so my prayers as we go through and feel the tension here 
We are saved by grace through faith. It's not of ourselves. It's a gift of God. And yet, if you've been looking at my Facebook page, I've been putting up verses from Jesus' own mouth that say things like this. Those who endure to the end shall be what? Shall be saved. And so as we go through not only Jesus' words, but we go through Hebrews, one of the things, one of the marks of a genuine believer is they endure to the end. It doesn't mean that there might not be a time in somebody's life where they start to, what do we call it? We have a word for this even. What is backsliding? Backsliding is actually going backwards. You're sliding back. Another word for that would be drifting. Take a look at point um, chapter 2, verse 1. Our first point, this major heading. For this reason, here's the imperative. We haven't seen any commands yet. For this reason. You're like, for what reason? Well, in chapter 1, it's exalting the person of the Lord Jesus. Who he is. What he's done. He made purification for sins. He's the Lord of glory. He's the creator. He's going to triumph over all of his enemies in the end. Because of that. Because of how great and supreme Jesus is. For this reason, you need to pay attention. How many of you didn't pay attention in school sometimes? Raise your hand. And you were shocked when the teacher had a pop quiz. And the teacher already warned you. Let me just warn you, I do pop quizzes. You better be staying up on your reading. And you did pay attention. And you were caught off guard. And guess what? Your grade score, my grade score. How many of you got caught not paying attention and really did terribly on some tests? Raise your hand. Let me see those hands. Right? You didn't pay attention. Now, we may laugh at some of those things where we don't pay attention. We pay small consequences. But just like that waterfall warning, there are some serious, let me just say this, the warnings that we see in Hebrew are far serious than going over a 300 foot waterfall that will absolutely end in death. There's something worse than that. So the writer says, based on everything that we've said just in chapter one, is enough reason for you to pay closer attention to what we have heard so that we don't what? Drift away from it. What is it that they have heard? They heard the good news of Jesus Christ. The good news to people who knew. Listen, one of the things that we see in the life of Jesus is as he shared the good news, and as we see in the book of Acts, this reoccurring theme, everybody that lives has a problem, a sin problem. And the good news is we have a Savior. And this good news, the good news of a Savior is calling people to saving faith in Him and they receive all the benefits of that saving faith, forgiveness of sins, the gift of eternal life. All of that is true. But as you read the gospel accounts, even when you see these great verses about eternal life, you also see verses about following Christ, enduring to the, enduring to the end. Hearing words like this, you must love me more than father, mother, son, or daughter, or you're not worthy to be my disciple. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, but yet not do what I say? And so this first warning is serious, is a serious warning. And the writer says, pay close attention. We must pay closer attention to what we've heard, the gospel. And not drift away from it. How were they drifting away? They were go thinking about going back to Judaism. Which would have been refuting the cross work of Jesus. Because the cross work of Jesus was sufficient. Let me give you some verses real quick. Let me say this. Myself and many others. Christians for 2,000 years. One of my favorite authors is Thomas Schreiner. Let me just say what he says according to this verse, these verses here. The New Testament nowhere teaches that an initial acceptance of the saving message is sufficient without perseverance in faith. Let me say that again. Nowhere, the New Testament nowhere teaches that initial acceptance of the saving message is sufficient without perseverance in faith. I said this earlier in my prayer, Romans chapter 15, verse 5 
Now to the God who grants perseverance. So one of the things that we're going to learn as we go through Hebrews is that God, listen, if you're a genuine believer, you're going to continue to make war on sin. The Holy Spirit is going to continue to convict you and convict you and call you to faithfully follow Christ and to not walk out on the Christian faith and to say this, you know what, I'm going to go live in the world. I'm going to go, listen, oh, I'm a Christian. I, I profess Christian, but, you know, I don't go to church anywhere and I live life the way I want to. And if I said, how many of you know people like this? They're, they're a dime a dozen. And here's the thing, what Tom Schreiner and many others, myself included, based on my reading of the New Testament says, it doesn't work that way. And these warnings are going to be used. Listen, if you're one of Christ's genuine followers, you're like, I'm, I'm paying attention. I'm paying attention. Write these verses down for those of you who don't have Facebook. I put a couple of these up last week. Matthew chapter 10, verse 21 and 22. Brother will betray brother to death. This, this, has happened, this happens in other countries. Happened, Right? I can give you stories of men and women who practice Islam, who are Muslims, who when they become Christians are faced with the death penalty. There are Hindus in India who when they become Christians and leave the teaching of Hinduism can be marked with death. I know a Jewish lady born in a, a home of a Jewish mother and father. She trusted that Jesus was the long awaited Jewish Messiah. They disowned her. How easy would it be just to not profess faith in Christ because of those threats? And listen to what Jesus said. Brother will betray brother to death. Father, his child, children will rise up against parents and cause them to be put to death. So Jesus is warning about discipleship. And listen to what he says. You will be hated by all because of my name. But it is the one who has endured to the end who will be saved. In Matthew 24, when he's talking about a time in history that will be unlike any other time in history. The tribulation, Jesus says, of those days before I return. There's no other time in history like this. But listen to what he says. Because of lawlessness, this is Matthew 24, verse 12 through 14. Because lawlessness has increased, most people's love will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. The gospel of this kingdom shall be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all the nations. And then the end will come. Then we have the parable of the soils. Write this one down. Matthew 13, where a farmer goes out and he throws seeds. And then he gives an interpretation of that parable. Listen to the parable of Jesus, the, the interpretation of it. The one on whom the seed was sown on the rocky places. This is a man who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no firm root in himself, but is only temporary. Listen to this. When the affliction... Or persecution arises because of the word, immediately he falls away. The one on whom the seed was sown among the thorns, this man hears the word, and the worry of the world and the deceitfulness of wealth choke out the word, and it becomes unfruitful. And the one on whom the seed was sown on good soil, this is the man or woman who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bear fruit and brings forth some a hundredfold, some to sixty, and some to thirty. The gospel of Luke, when Luke pins this parable, he says, and, and with it, perseverance. This idea that some people initially say, oh, I'll follow Jesus. And they, they have some outward super, it looks like joy. And then what? They fall away. Why? Because their wife got cancer. When something happened to one of their kids. They lost a job. Thousands of other things cause them to say, I'm out of here. Take a look at Hebrews. You're in Hebrews. Take a look at chapter three. This is where we're headed. This, folks, this is a sermon that we all should be like, I'm paying attention. I'm paying attention. Because that's what he says to do. Pay attention so we don't what? Drift away from what we've heard. Have you ever been boating and you, you're trying to set the anchor, but you keep finding it keeps drifting? That's, that's the imagery here. Drifting away from that gospel message you've heard. And listen, the new look at chapter three. Let me show you this. This is 
This is where we're heading. And this is the theme of what he's setting the stage for. Chapter 3, verse 6. But Christ was faithful as a son over his house, whose house we are. Listen, if we hold fast our confidence and the boast of our hope, what is this? how does it end? The reason I'm asking you this, because I want you to see, this is these are the words of the Bible, not me. This is Holy Scripture saying this to us. Hope, what? Our hope firm to the end. Chapter 3, verse 12. Take care, brethren. Here's the next warning we're going to be looking at. Take care, brethren, that there not be any one of you with an evil, unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God, but encourage one another. Day after day, as long as it is still called today, so that none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Well, listen, how, what are some of the means that God uses for us to pay attention? Well, one of the things is encourage one another day after day. Church life, not just meeting here. Hebrews chapter 10 talks about, um, you know, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the hub, habit of some. Actually, it's happening. And if you think we're, we're I mean, think about that. Think about the means that God can use to keep you fresh and alert and paying attention. It's the encouragement of other believers in the community, not just here on a Sunday morning as we gather together. As we see each other struggle. As a guy warned, a guy in the, in the creek, in the stream, on top of the falls, as you read through one of these stories, a guy said, get out of there. And I'll, we'll share exactly the words that he used, but the guy got out of there. What are you doing? You're a confessing Christian. What are you doing? What's going on? Now, you're saying, Kendall, are you saying that Christians don't ever drift? They do. And how seriously should we take that drift? My hallway lights wouldn't work this last week. So I called up a church member who was an electrician for many years. I'm not going to tell you his name. Well, Rick, okay. Well. <laughs> Rick is a... He, I've always trusted him when he tells me about electricity. So I call him up and I said, I changed the bulbs. They, and it's a good bulb because I tried it in other sockets. So I have three lights in my hallway. And Ruthie, light, her mom and dad wanted to have light in the hallway. And so... I'm like, something's wrong. So I call Rick, take the cover off and take the cover off. I send him a picture. He says, well, there ought to be another switch. So I have two switches at the end of my hallway. Well, guess what I found last week? I found out I had a third switch that I never knew about. Right? And where was I going with that illustration? I have no idea. But it was funny. No. Listen, I hate working with electricity, but I pay really close attention. I, I want to make sure the power's off. So I got here. Oh, here it is. He said, you need a voltmeter. You need to find out where the power is going to those switches so that you know where the problem lies. And so I found in my garage, he said, I've got three of them. I said, I'll be down if I can't find mine. Because, you know, my garage is it's so neat. I know where everything's at. But I found it. It had never been opened. And so I went and guess what I did? I put it in the socket. Beep, 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 beep. Light comes on. How many of you wish you had something like that when it came to the profession of other people? See, it's so easy to profess something. John, First John is all about warning. I want you to know that you have eternal life. Chapter 5. I think it's verse 12 or 13 says that I've written these things to you so that you may know you have eternal life. And throughout first John, this is what it says. The one who says I've come to know him, but is living in practice, unhabitual sin. John says he's of the devil. Why? Because you can't go on in a, in a habitual practicing sin because you've been born again. How many of you are like that? That's what the Bible says. Well, turn over to first John. I'll show you. So it's not just in profession, it's actually in possessing. So John says this, if you don't say that Jesus is the son of God, you don't have eternal life. So profession is no doubt true. You got to profess that Jesus is the son of God. And I said this, if somebody says I'm a Christian, but they don't believe 
that Jesus was fully God, fully man. They're not a Christian. Why? Because we do have some texts that are clear. But when it gets to the test, I don't have a meter to say, well, is this practicing or are they repenting or am I repenting or is this practicing? And these warnings should like make us pay attention. Are you in chapter, are you in John's first John? Listen to this. You know, verse five, you know that he appeared to take away sins and no one, and in him, there is no sin. No one who abides in him sins. Wait, you say in chapter one, he says, chapter one and two, he says, um, if you say you don't have sin, you're a what? You're a liar. That's chapter one, verse 10. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar. <laughs> you say, how is this? Here's where a knowledge of the Greek is helpful. It's a, it's a present participle. And some of your translations will say practicing, practicing. Let me show you this. Let's keep reading. Little children, make sure no one deceives you, verse 7. The one who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous. The one who practices sin is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. The Son of God appeared for this purpose, to destroy the works of the devil. No one who is what? Anybody have their Bibles open? Born of God practices. Why? Because his seed abides in him. It's like this. He cannot sin because he's born of God. John's saying this. Do you know the reason why it's impossible? Because if you're born of God and the spirit of God dwells on in you, you can't just continue and sin. The Holy Spirit is pricking your conscience. And here's the danger. Here's the hardship. You know people who habitually year after year, they don't meet with Christians. They haven't taken the Lord's Supper in 20 years. They live in the world. And yet people say, you know what, Johnny, Johnny walked the aisle when he was 15. He said he was a Christian. He got baptized. Yeah. And what does the Bible say? How many of you know people like this? Raise your hand. And what does the Bible do to us? The Bible says, is that really true? Look what all these verses teach. They're serious verses. Now, because of this warning, let me ask you a couple questions. If someone was a professing believer at one time, but now denies the resurrection of Jesus, are they a Christian? Can you deny the resurrection of Jesus and still actually be a Christian? I mean, actually believe that. And it's ongoing. It's like, it's not somebody wrestling with something for a short time, but like, yeah, this guy was a pastor, but his wife, true story, wife got cancer. He's been a professing atheist now for over 15 years. True story. I used to have the cassette tape. You guys know what cassette tapes are? You still have them. I threw a bag of them away because I don't have a cassette player anymore, but you can find them online. Listen, folks, you know people like this. The answer is no. You must believe in the resurrection of Jesus. That's a basic. So if you're there with me saying no, there are certain things that if you deny them, now you can't claim to be a Christian. You're saying, really? Yeah, that's 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 3. Romans chapter 10, verse 9 and 10. If you confess him with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. Believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. You shall be what? Saved. 1 Corinthians 15, where Paul had some people doubting the resurrection. He says, I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, in which you are saved, if you hold fast the word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. Unless you believed in vain, meaning it was fickle faith. It wasn't genuine faith. You believed in vain. If you deny the resurrection, so if that's clear, then we have to look at these other verses. And that is not just a profession, but actually possession. So 1 John chapter 3 talks about this ongoing practicing. But let me just tell you, first, write this down. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11 says the same thing. Galatians chapter 5, verse 19 through 21 says the same thing. If you don't make war on sin, I wish I had a meter. We all wish we had a meter. And the longer, listen, the longer it goes, the question mark gets bigger. My font size for my sermons and stuff I type out, I used to be able to read font 8, 10, 12. Guess where I'm up to now? 
and I have bifocals. I'm up to font 14. The longer it goes, the font gets bigger. The warnings get stronger. You need to warn people. Why? Because the New Testament does. We're not playing around whether somebody sips hot coffee or not. I'm not worried about the government coming in, worried whether or not I took off the tag off my pillow that says, do not take this tag. It's a federal law. I'm not real worried about that. Are you? By the way, yes, I have all the tags on my pillow, okay? But there are just certain warnings that just really aren't that serious and we don't take them seriously. And the book of Hebrews says you better. Let's move quickly. For if the word spoken through angels pro uh, proved unalterable. Now, I wrote down a ton of verses because this is interesting. Acts chapter 7, write this down. I don't have time to deal with it. Acts chapter 7, Stephen, this is verse 37, speaks of the angels spoke to Moses on Mount Sinai. Verse 53 says, you receive the law as ordained by angels. Verse 53, Galatians 3, 19, mentions, Paul mentions, why the law then? It was added because of transgressions having been ordained through angels by the agency of a mediator. I don't understand that, but evidently the angels had something involved in the giving of the law, inspired by God, but they were used as mediators of this revelation. Notice the, how the writer is using this. If the word spoken through angels provide, proved unalterable, and every, listen, every transgression, every disobedience received just retribution. Have you ever read the laws of the old co Mosaic covenant? The death penalty for over 20 violations, strict laws. How, look at verse three. How will we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? He argues from the lesser to the greater. Why? I believe because we're talking about eternal destinies and the final judgment. And then what's proved by a greater revelation, take a look at verse 3 again. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation. Don't escape that. Think about that. What kind of salvation do we have? It's amazing. I knew a guy up until his 90s, every single prayer that I ever heard him pray always included this. Lord, thank you for so great a salvation. He never got over his conversion and knowing the Lord. And he lived out a godly life until he's 90s. Listen, you can look at salvation as what the Lord has done being so wonderful that you say, God, I'm going to take every single warning in your word seriously. And God uses that warning in our lives to what keep us on the path. Notice what he says as far as why is it greater? Well, after it was first spoken by the Lord... So the Lord spoke about this great salvation. It was confirmed to us by those who heard. So it was confirmed by us who heard. God testifying with them both by signs and wonders, by various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his own will. So what is he saying there? Well, is it enough that the Lord spoke about this? It was confirmed by, by us. But what did the apostles do? The Lord confirmed. Just like this. In, in John's gospel, signs that Jesus did pointed so they were authenticating signs. Meaning his miracles pointed to the fact that he was telling the truth about everything that he said. By what authority are you doing this? Well, can you raise the dead? Can you heal the lame? Can you give sight to the blind? then you better listen up because guess what you're witnessing right now? If you don't believe my words, Jesus said, then believe the deeds themselves. They point to who I am. And so what did God do after the Lord was raised from the dead? 
as the apostles went out, God granted them miracles to attest to the truthfulness of their message. So what the writer is saying is, you're without excuse. You're without excuse. You have no excuse to depart from the Christian faith. Well, people weren't friendly at church. I got a whole list of excuses. Well, their old life pulled them back. Well, they're a busy person. Well, they found people unfriendly. Well, they were disillusioned with other Christians. Well, they worked for a boss who said he was a Christian, but man, he sure didn't like it, act like it. Boy, the, I worked around coworkers. They really, I was really offended at how they acted. Well, I just got out of the habit of going. How long has it been? Oh, 20 years. So you love Jesus? Oh, I love Jesus. Well, Jesus said, if you love me, obey me. Jesus said, do this in what? Remembrance of me. Hmm. Struggles, hardships. What did Jesus say? Well, when hardships come up, when wealth, sin, those things, what? They start paying attention to those things. We love these things. It's scary. I mean, this, this sermon should be like, I want to pay attention. And it's not this other extreme. You've met them. Oh, Lord, am I saved? Have I prayed enough? Have I read enough? Have I witnessed enough? I don't know if I'm saved. Well, that, yeah. If you're in a church that teaches that, something's wrong. I mean, you understand the difference here. I hope you do. To take sin seriously, to take what I believe about the Lord Jesus and say, I can't just say, I've got, I've got the get out of jail free card. Let me give you some proofs. Turn to quickly with our time left. I want to show you how the salvation confirmed. So the Lord spoke it. It was confirmed by those who heard. Turn to Acts chapter 22. I think this helps us in understanding signs. In Acts 22, this is what Peter said. Men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs which God performed through him in your midst, just as you yourselves know. This man delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to the cross by hands of godless men and put him to death. But God raised him up putting an end to the agony of death since it was impossible for him to be held in its power. What did God do? Attested with what? Signs and wonders. In chapter 2, verse 43, it says, Everyone kept feeling a sense of awe, and many signs and wonders were taking place through the apostles. Now what Hebrews chapter 2, verse 4 says? God testifying with them both by signs and wonders and various miracles by gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his will. That's what we read in the book of Acts. Take a look at Acts 5. At the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were taking place among the people. In chapter 14, when they're at Iconium and he's preaching the gospel, many people believe, but other people got mad. Some Jews and Gentiles got mad. Persecuting them. Paul says, we just kept relying on the Lord and kept preaching the gospel and God granting that signs and wonders be done at their hands. And verse eight talks about a man who was unable to walk since he was born and listening to Paul, Paul healed the guy. And then the people started saying, you guys must be gods. And you know, what Paul, Paul, they're like, no, we're, we are just mere men. Take a, take a look at chapter 14 and read it sometimes. So what did God do? Listen, as we close, listen. You have no, we have no excuse not to pay attention and to take the warnings seriously. Why? The Lord spoke about it, confirmed by those who heard. God attested how? By giving the apostles, what? Sign gifts. The writer of Hebrews is saying, Jesus' authority our salvation is so much greater, but the warning is also greater. Now, I struggle with this because you might say, well, the drifting doesn't 
say exactly what happens if we neglect. But as we go through and look at the warnings and we see what it says about perseverance. So let me, let me close with this. One, the Lord can discipline any of us as children. Take a look at chapter 12. So one, if we're genuinely his, a couple of ways the Lord can get our attention if we begin to drift. And friends, drifting happens easily. You fall out of going for a while and stop reading the word and stop listening to, you know, focusing on the things, not being around other believers and all, all of a sudden you're further down the stream. God can use things in our lives to get us back. Where he talks about, all right, let's see. Where's it that he starts talking about as a father disciplines? I thought I had it written down. I guess I didn't. Where he talks about a father. If we have an earthly father who disciplines us. 12-9. Thank you, Jimmy. Let me pick it up in verse 7. It is for discipline that you endure. God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there that whom his father does not discipline? But if you are without discipline, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate children and nonsense. Furthermore, if we had earthly fathers to discipline us and we respected them, shall we not much rather be subject here to, to the father of spirits and live? For if they disciplined us for a short time, as seemed best to them, but he disciplines us for our, notice what it says, our own good so that we may share his holiness. All discipline for a moment is not joyful, but sorrowful. Yet to those who have been trained by it afterwards, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. Let me just say this. I think I'll close with this. I think it's true both ways we could apply this. I don't want to drift because I don't want the disciplining hand of the Lord because I believe I'm one of his. And the Lord disciplines his children. So that's my first application. I want to take my, my, my Christian life seriously and pay attention and not drift. I don't want to neglect such a great salvation. Why? Because the Lord can at any time easily pull the rug out from under my feet and get my attention. How I many of you know the Lord can do that? Now, here's the problem. We don't know when we go through trials. Who's behind that trial? I'll tell you what, I want to take every opportunity that whatever I go through in life, it is what? Getting my attention. Whether it's the Lord actually saying, I'm disciplining you because we don't know. But what we do is I'm going to examine my own life first. I want to, I always, we should always want to be sensitive and hard and say, Lord, I want to repent of any known sin in my life. I don't want to just take your grace for granted. Number two, I would say, it should scare the H-E double hockey sticks out of us. It really should. I think the warning in here is the last judgment. Because why? Over and over, the key is we must endure to the end or we can't claim. As he says in chapter 3, verse 6, if we hold fast our confidence, what? To the end. For we have become partakers in Christ in the past. Meaning, it was a genuine experience, Kendall, in 1989. If you hold fast the beginning of your assurance, when? Do I believe that I genuinely got converted in 1989? Absolutely. And what Paul is, or what the writer, excuse me, the writer in 314, it says, you know what? You have become partakers of Christ. Meaning, that was a genuine experience. If you hold fast the beginning of your assurance from to the end. And I, I couple that with the words of Jesus. And I say this, I have no other option. Why don't you bow your head with me for a moment? Does the Lord, let me ask you, just between you and the Lord. Listen, we're reading God's word today. Does the Lord have your attention? Are you paying attention this morning? Do you know people that evidently aren't paying attention? Because they act as if drifting away is no problem at all. They're just having fun on the lazy river. Lazing it up in this world. 
No problem. I got the get out of jail free card by the Lord when I was 20. Friends, I, I hope this sermon God uses. If you're a genuine believer, this is what the Lord's going to do. He's going to use this sermon for you to navigate through this world. And I, I, this is my prayer. That God will not let his word that what we read today escape our minds. So open up your heart today and say, Lord, I, I believe I'm a confessing Christian. That I genuinely know you. Would you use these warnings in my life? Lord, use them. I want to stay on the path. I want to continue to confess you and live for you until I meet you. Is that your prayer's heart? It's just like that first song that we prayed. Lord, take this heart. Weld it to yourself. Weld me to you. Use the spirit to convict me and to cause me. To follow you all the days of my life. Friend, if you're here today, let me just say this. God offers a great salvation. Forgiveness and eternal life. But he, in doing that, he's calling you to be a disciple and a lifelong follower of Jesus Christ. So if you come to him today, if you come to him next week, he's calling you to lifelong following the Lord Jesus it's appointed for every man and woman here to die and then to face judgment. And if you neglect such a great salvation, you're in grave peril, especially if you're not a believer. You've heard the gospel and you neglect it totally. If you die today on your way home, let me just say to you, the word of God, you will stand in judgment as he sentenced you. Oh God, would you stir our hearts? Thank you for your word that's so powerful and active and sharper than a knife itself. It can penetrate our innermost being. Lord, thank you that you're gracious that if we confess our sins, you're faithful and just to for, forgive us and to cleanse us. May we as your people be a people that is stirred by your spirit. We thank you for every person that's here today. To worship you and to follow you. We pray this in Jesus' name and all God's people said, Amen. Let's stand together as we close.